covered around Kepler, right? Uh, with a probe called Kepler as well. So it's about five minutes presentation, five minutes discussion, roughly. Okay, five, seven, four and a half, roughly. Art included. <laughs> <laughs> Danish, you want to try talking loud, loud, loud so we can listen to you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Try the dip. All right. So today I'm going to talk about Kepler 10b, which is um, which is the which is the first of small rocky planets. Yeah, exactly. So this is the first confirmed or essentially confirmed rocky exoplanet. Actually, right? no, I'm not really. Um, there's other um, confirmed rocky planets. This um, this is um, like um, the first and has more credit because it, they know their composition better than. Yeah. So the others are kind of, some people have some doubts still, right? Do but you is saying that some other exoplanets, some people think they might... So, um, by NASA's um, Kepler telescope and also by the Keck Observatory. And then and NASA's telescope is up in space on a mission to find um, Earth-like and habitable planets and Keck is in a Hawaii. So they did this method and they, um, one way they found it is by astroseismology ob observations, um, which means that they like they find a they do like they find a star quakes or oscillations, and then after that they get they can get information of Kip um, Kipper 10b, and they also use the transit method, which is. Um, like here is when um, when this um, planet crosses the star, a dip of it and the brightness comes, and then when the planet goes back here somewhere around that, it comes back to its organo uh, thing. So it's like an eclipse, kind of a little bit, yeah. right? Okay, everyone understand that the transit technique, right? If you have a planet passing in front of a star, it will block a little bit of the total brightness of the star. And you got to dip in the flux, right? So that's one way to. Can I use this technique to detect all planets that have, all stars that have planets? What about if it is perpendicular to me? If the orbit goes like that, it's never edge on. So I can only use this technique if I am in the line of sight with the planet system, right? If instead the, the planet goes around the star like that, I will never see it transiting, right? So it works for some cases, but not for all cases. Good, good. Yeah. And then my dad, um, they found out the uh, mass of the planet. But and for this case, the dip, uh, the uh, dip of the brightness is zero point zero one five percent. Mm -hmm. And then they use the. Um, so what can we conclude about the dip of the brightness, Tanish? That tells us what from the planet itself. Uh, the mass. The mass or the size? Um, if, if, if it passes in front of the star, just from the transit technique, I see how much of the star brightness <coughs> goes away. So I can compute the diameter, right? The diameter, right? And then the mass is slighter because of another technique, not because of the transit. It's the the tugs, right? The Doppler shift, right? That's why you need a CAC telescope, yeah. right? So the transit technique, you see, if you have a bigger planet, it will block more of the star or less of the star. So the decrease in brightness will be proportional to the relative apparent size of the planet. So it gives you size information, so diameter, right? That's a transit. And then we can talk about the mass as well, right, Tanis? And then, and then um, when they uh, use the Keck Observatory and the Kepler um, telescope, then they, um, then they find out the density. And, yeah. and the density of this um, pl planet is um, 8.8 um, Kepler 10. Mm -hmm. And of course, Earth has this 
um, star called the Sol, also the sun. Yeah, it's Latin for sun, yeah, Sol. Yeah. Portuguese as well. And now uh, the stars age, um, I mean the planet stars age is eight, um, eight billion years long. Um, U.S. billions, right? That's 10 to the 9 giga. Remember, we're not in the United States anymore. You are in astronomy, right? <laughs> so you say billion is 10 to the 9, right? So giga years, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's older than our sun, therefore, isn't it? Yeah. Our sun is actually 4.6 um, giga. giga years mm -hmm. to be accurate. <laughs> exactly. Okay. And so just go back one. Tanish mentioned that. This transit method. And then you also use a Doppler shift, right? Mm -hmm. The Doppler shift has to do with how much the star is tugged back and forward, right? right? And this back and forward movement, because the star also feels the influence of the planet, so the position of the star slightly changes according to having the planet closer to it. The planet goes to the other side, the planet goes closer to the star, the star wobbles back and forth a little bit. And this, this wobbling back and forth, it's proportional to the mass, right? And so remember, the transit technique that Tanishk made the drawing there allows you to know the size. Size the volume. and mass, yeah, well, the volume, exactly. Volume and mass brings it to, to, to density, right? That's how density was known. So that's why you combine these two techniques, the transit method and the Doppler shift. We shall discuss this in more detail in chapter 14. Closer, uh, closer than, uh, than 0.3 million years minutes. So what's the total mass also? So it's more massive than Mercury denser than our planet and closer to the local star than Mercury is, right? So it must be a very iron-rich, super-hot ball, right? <laughs> kind but of. It's, it's like, I think, um, super-Earth kind of thing. Super-Earth, yeah, but the, the density is more like Mercury, right? Uh, probably. And it's too close to the sun, to the local sun, so it's probably melting, kind of, super-hot. So it's, it's not on the living zone, the habitable zone, probably. It's yeah, too close. It's, it's, um, right? it's Right now, I just said it's somewhere here. Exactly. Um, also, we shall discuss this business of the habitable zone in the future, okay, chapter 13, but it's a good introduction today as well. So, now, chapter 10, B has a circular orbit, mm -hmm. which means it has an eccentricity um, of zero. Yep. And Earth has an elliptical orbit. Mm -hmm. And then, like how I said, that. Um, Kepler 10b is not an habitable world, and Earth is. Yep. Um, how scientists know alien planet Kepler 10b is a rock, small rocky planet? I got it from space.com, and same thing for, uh, for this one. How, now, the discovers smallest alien planet yet. Okay, what doubts? Uh, I have lots of questions, but I don't want to monopolize. Just me talking is no fun, okay. right? <laughs> so, how? What about how does Kepler discover these things? Anyway, I, I don't know. First thing comes to my mind is, what kind of sensor? How does uh, Kepler has what? They use a um, photometer for the transit meter. Okay, so it, it measures all the light, right, coming down. Visible light, infrared. I'm not, I, I'm not sure for sure. Okay, we shall see in the future that's important to measure actually both, right? When you look into the transit technique, um, think about it. The planet is colder than the star, right? When the planet goes behind the star, you don't see the planet anymore. So you, you have an eclipse of the planet. So the same way you eclipse the star and you see a dip on the flux of the star, when, you, when the planet is eclipsed, you see less than when the planet contributes to the total flux. Actually, the, um, the real accurate like, um, transit thing is actually just a few dots all over the Sure, sure, of course. The data, you, you fit, you fit yeah. the line, exactly. It's like all over the place. But that's with the visible light from the star. It's important in some cases to also measure the infrared light from the planet. We shall discuss that in the future, but so that's why one should know what kind of sensor you're using, infrared or visible only. But uh, that's a possible question about Kepler B. Okay, no so questions? I actually, actually, I would like to also tell you, mm -hmm. um, there's a, um, this, um, actually this solution, um, this uh, sun system, or, or like, or, uh, has only, uh, it has two um, planets. The second one is Kepler 10c, mm -hmm. but that planet is unconfirmed. And, uh. I'm, and I'm not sure where it is, actually. Um, I, it might be a game somewhere. Um, 
further out. Yeah, no, um, like, not after the, not after Mercury's orbit, somewhere, like, closer than Mercury again. I see. Just one final question. Which constellation is this star at? Do you know? Uh, you tell us the distance, but where in the sky, by chance? Um, um, Just like, you know the... Cygna, or? Yes, yeah, Cygna. Cygnus, the, the swan? The, no? Uh, Cygni? Um, Three constellations, I, I I think it is. The first one is Draco. Uh -huh. The second one, is, I think it is Cygnus. And the third one is Lyra. So is it between those, you say? Um, in, in I'm, the I'm not sure for it okay. exactly. Don't worry. But I'm uh, that those are the ones I think it, um, it, it might be in. Okay. okay. It must be one of them only because yeah. this is around the star of one of those constellations. Um, I, I, somewhere I read it was... Um, in Draco, but then in my article it said also um, the Kepler 10 B and um, Kepler is actually looking inside the Cygnus and Lyra. So I so by then I just make yeah one needs to label yeah, them. It's like too. two different things. I just can't figure out. Yeah, journalists. Huh? <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. Th let's thank Tanish. <laughs> okay, if we don't have questions. You take the seat again. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Let's resume the class. Well done, Danish. Don't worry, I can erase it. Thank you very much. Sir. <laughs>